Hey, this is Elijah with the Oxygen Team, and in today's video, we're taking a look at another basic building block that you'll find on most websites. We've already covered headers, hero sections, and social proof, so today I wanna to talk about content. Now, technically, anything on a website could be considered content, but I wanna talk specifically about the types of content that normally come right after the top section of your landing page. So let's take a look at a few examples. If we take a look at Discord, we have our header hero, and then we come down to this section, which has an image and a heading and some text, and then it alternates back and forth. This is what I would consider content. So this is what we're gonna kind of focus on today. And I was gonna do a couple variations of content layouts, but I started looking at examples and pretty much all of them followed the same alternating image and text pair pattern. So we'll probably stick with that, though we may try a few things along the way. Here's MailChimp, and if we scroll on down, here's a content area. This one's a little bit unique because there's an image on the left-hand side here. It's not loading at the moment. Let me refresh really quickly. And now you can see that image and it kind of floats along. Now, we could build this with oxygen where the image transitions as you come to the next heading and text set, but that would get into some more advanced topics. So we're probably not gonna do that, though we may do some kind of an approximation of this effect. I think it would be kind of fun to build. So then let's move on to DoorDash. And the same kind of scheme here, once you get past the initial kind of feature sections and the hero, you get this alternating layout where they use it to explain more about their product or service. And finally, here's Stash, an investing app, and again, same pattern. So the interesting thing is that this pattern is used widely across lots of successful websites, which means we probably don't wanna reinvent the wheel. So let's go ahead and jump over to Oxygen and see what we can do. So here's what we've built previously. We've got our header, our hero, some social proof littered throughout. Now we wanna add a content section. So I'm not sure exactly where we're gonna put it yet, but probably right after this here, We'll probably rearrange this a little bit and move this social proof down a little bit. So let's go ahead and drop in a section and start getting our arrangement in order. So let's open up the structure pane and this here section should be where our testimonial lives and there it is. So this we're probably gonna move around but for now let's just hide that. Let's get it out of the way. So just click the little eye icon there next to that element. Now we can work with this section here without worrying about that for the time being. So in its most basic form, this type of content really is just serving to provide more context for your product or service that you're offering. And by having some associated illustrations or images, it becomes a lot more engaging. You'll also see that a lot of times these are accompanied by a button or a CTA that drives the user toward your goal, which we don't see there or there. Uh, we do here, where do we see it? On DoorDash, we do see the Get the App button and the Find the Restaurants button, which are technically separate CTAs. On Stash, we have a subtle link there. So you may or may not want a call to action in your alternating content area. That just depends on the goals for the website. So let's go back here and start building this out. Now, traditionally, we would use a columns element for this kind of layout, but with Oxygen, it's also super easy to use CSS grid. So let's just do that for this particular example. So let's add a grid and we'll set the column count to two and set the min width to 10 pixels or something like that. Gap to 32 pixels on both row and column. And that should be all we need to adjust for now. Now we can drop in an image element and you can see it's gonna take up roughly 50% of the space available. And then we can add a div which will contain our text element. So let's add a text which will be our overline. Let's duplicate that which will be our kind of heading element. And then we'll duplicate that and that will be our longer text content. So let's do some lorem ipsum in here and then we'll adjust that as needed. And then this text element, let's see if we have some established classes or anything we can reuse here. Here's an overline, let's see if we used a class we did not. But now that we have two elements that need similar styles, we can go ahead and kind of retroactively implement a class. So we'll call this overline, we'll add the class, 
then we can use our little selector drop down here and we can copy the ID styles to the class. And now if we want, we can also erase the ID styles. So now this is styled by a class, which means we can go down and add the overline class to this element and get the same exact styles. And I'm not sure what that needs to say yet, so we'll just leave that like that. And then this will be a big heading for this entry. And then let's go back up and see if we have any other styles we can reuse. This is an actual heading. Uh, we may use a heading here, though you have to be really careful with real headings to ensure your hierarchy is correct. Uh, this is an H1, so I guess these could be H2. So let me actually just add a heading element here instead, and then we'll swap the tag over to H2. Note, you never want more than one H1, so be mindful of that. So let's get rid of that and then we'll say content headline. So this is the basic skeleton of pretty much all of these content areas that we're looking at. Except for this one, it's a little unique, we might go into that, but for now we're focusing on these more basic layouts. So from there, we really just have some design choices to make. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna add some space here between these elements, so I'll use gap and add 16 pixels. And then because I want this heading up a little bit closer to the overline, I'll set the top margin to negative 16 pixels, which will remove that gap. And let's go ahead and collapse our structure pane until we need it. And let's drop in an image here so that we can see a little bit more what this is actually gonna look like in practice. So let's browse. And I have a bunch of placeholder images here I could drop in. So if we wanted to just use this most basic layout, we could totally do that. So we could go ahead and just duplicate these elements and have them alternate throughout this section. And because we used grid, we can actually just duplicate them directly within the section and then arrange them how we want so that they alternate. So let's duplicate this div, which will bring it down. And you can see now we get that alternating pattern. Now, what do we do with mobile and something like this? Normally, you're gonna want the images to come before the content or the text in these layouts. So let's step this down and take a look at what that looks like. And probably about right here is where you want these things to start stacking vertically. So that's really easy to do in Oxygen. You just select your section where you've defined your grid. We're gonna define grid again. And then we're gonna set our column count to one. And you can see that it works beautifully. Now you are going to run into issues sometimes with the order of elements within the container. But since we're using grid, we can actually control the placement of elements on the grid. So we can do that with a little bit of custom CSS. This gets into slightly more advanced territory, but it's certainly manageable for anyone that's even slightly familiar with CSS. So let's jump into the advanced tab on our image with our breakpoint selected and we'll go to custom CSS. Now the property we wanna manipulate is grid row start. Okay, this is gonna tell our element where it should exist within our grid. If we do one, for instance, it's gonna move it up to the top. Let's go ahead and change this image really quickly just so that we can see what we're doing. Let's select that one. And you can see that it's there at the top because we said to start at grid row one. We can change this to grid row start two and move it down to the second row. So you can see where logically we could control where we want this and achieve a really good result by using grid row start three. And now assuming we have a few more elements here, you would have to manipulate the grid row start on your chosen breakpoint for each of your image elements to move them exactly where you want. And you can see by moving between breakpoints, we still have this alternating layout everywhere else above that. But when we get down here, we get this nice image then text layout, which again is usually what you want it to collapse down to. So now that the responsiveness is addressed, let's go back up to desktop and let's do a few maybe more interesting things here. We've basically accomplished this kind of a layout. Design aesthetic aside, you can adjust it to look however you'd like, but the bones are essentially there for this alternating content layout. This is the same thing, uh, but it does include a button. So let's go ahead and throw a button into this layout just to spruce it up a bit. So we'll select this last text element and let's add a link wrapper. and then we'll add some text. Now before we do anything, let's see if we have any buttons on the page we can use. It looks like we do. 
And since this isn't using a class yet, we're gonna go ahead and retroactively implement a class because we now have two elements that need the same style. So we'll just call this button. And then again, we're gonna copy the styles from the ID to the class, and then we'll delete the styles from the ID. And let's check and see if we have any styles applied to this text element. Usually when using link wrappers, I don't recommend styling the text inside the link wrappers directly unless you really need to. Generally, it's much easier just to apply typography styles to your link wrappers so that anytime you use that link wrapper with this button class, it's going to give the correct text color to the text inside of it. So now you'll see we can go down here, we can select our link wrapper, and we can add that button class. And now we have a button with identical styles dropped in in just a click. No big deal. And we'll just change this text to learn more now. And there's a little bit of extra space here. Now this is something you'll run into where you have some styles for something in a specific location, but then you decide to reuse those styles elsewhere. And this has some size and spacing, some big margin uh, top and bottom, which is just not appropriate for it in this other location, right? So how do we solve that? We can't just change it because if we change it down here, for instance, we select this button, go to advanced size and spacing and set the top margin to zero. Well, that's gonna break the top margin up here and we want it there. So this is where modified classes can come in handy. There are some more advanced topics around how to write your CSS class names. We're not gonna jump into that. Instead, I'm just gonna show you how to modify a class. So we're gonna remove the top and bottom margin from the button class, and then we're gonna create a new class called button dash dash margin. Now you might want a more descriptive name for this if you're working on a project with a lot of classes, but in this case, we just have a couple of classes so we can use this and we can reasonably assume what button dash dash margin means. And then on that class, instead of the main button class, we add the 32 pixels top and bottom, 64 pixels there. Now you'll note it didn't do anything. That's because I have this button selected. And even though I don't need the class on this button, that's okay. We've gotten the class set up and we can now remove it from that button and add it where we need it. So let's select this link wrapper and we'll add our margin class here. So it's button dash dash margin. And now this button will have the button styles that we want to reuse, but it'll also have some unique styles that are only used in cases where we need more space above and below the button. So going down here, we now have a slightly more interesting layout. Let's just copy and paste that button over into this one. And I think that about covers probably the most reliable kind of content layout for your landing pages. As you can see from the examples I found, most sites are using some permutation of this pattern. But I do like the MailChimp layout where they have this floating image and I do want to try to create this. So let's go ahead and jump in here. And as you can see, we already have a content area here. I'm just gonna kind of adapt it. So we are gonna have to move away from the grid layout, I believe. I'm not positive, so we might try it. Let's uh, get rid of this image because we may not need it yet. And then let's move this div. Yeah, so we're gonna need to rearrange things a little bit. So we'll still need this right-hand div. So let's get rid of the content inside of that. And then we want that content to exist in there, but we want it to be in its own div within that. So let's drop that in. So now we can have multiple uh, content areas here that are on the right-hand side. We're also gonna need some more space between them, so let's jump that gap up to 128 pixels. Let's try 256, because we need some room to scroll with this image. Now we can select the image, and we can go to Advanced Custom CSS, and we're gonna set Position to Sticky, and Top to Zero. Top is just the distance from the top of the viewport where the element becomes sticky. Now let's go ahead and I need to hide this element on the front end. So let me just add a condition really quickly. This is not something you really need to worry about yet. We have other videos on conditions. Basically all I'm doing is setting a condition that will never be true. And since we'll never have a user with the ID of sandwich Steve, this columns element will never be shown on the front end. So we've effectively hidden it. 
And we may not even need a preview on the front end. In fact, you can just see it here. As we scroll down, this image floats with us. So then the question is, how do we achieve the changing of the image as we scroll? Now you can use a third party animation library like GSAP or something like that to achieve some really cool scroll based animations. Oxygen also includes animate on scroll, which can trigger animations when elements come into the viewport, but it's not really capable of things that change as you scroll. So I think in this case, the easiest thing to do would be to just have multiple images, each with a sticky position so that they kind of collapse down on each other. So let's go ahead and try that. So to do that, we're gonna need these images to be in a div. So let's click our pencil icon and click wrap with div. And so now we can have multiple images in this left-hand side. Now we want the space to be pretty much the same as the right-hand div. So we're gonna select the, our div and go over and set our gap to 256 pixels. So that gets everything aligned. And now you can kind of see this effect, right? It's going down, 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 and then that next image is gonna be sticky. And let's add another section below this to give us some space to scroll past. We'll just drag a bunch of top padding into that section. There we go, now we can see the full effect. Uh, so we've essentially achieved this. Let's change our images so that we can see uh, the difference as we scroll and see what's layering and where. And we'll browse for an image here as well. So now you can see, while it's not quite as fancy and elegant as the MailChimp implementation, where you have an image that's changing uh, or fading as you scroll to the next uh, text area that triggers that change, it does still achieve a pretty neat effect. And you can see that our first image collapses down underneath the next image, and then that one follows us, and then we get to the last one. So let's save this and take a look at the front end. We'll jump up here and we'll scroll down. And as you can see, our design is coming together. This page is really coming to life as we start exploring each type of section that makes up a page like this. But let's scroll down to our content area just below our first social proof. And you can see we have our content, some explanation, an illustration, and a button, it looks really nice. And then as we scroll, we get this sticky effect. Now note that when you're logged in, you have about 32 pixels up here that's gonna be obscured because of the admin bar. Most sites don't need to worry about this, but if you are keeping the admin bar on the front end for logged in users, you'll probably want to account for that in your CSS. But anyways, as we scroll down, you can see that we get that cool collapsing effect and then the next image becomes sticky so on and so forth. So that's a slightly more advanced content area, but it just goes to show you once you have that core layout that we started with, it's really easy to implement some of these more advanced design choices. So again, this is Elijah with the Oxygen team, and that's a quick look at how to create a basic content area for your website using Oxygen. Thanks for watching.